Thank you to the Civil War Roundtable Congress. My name is Lisa G. Samia. This presentation is on my poetry and essay book, The Nameless and the Faceless Women of the Civil War, just released April 2021. Portions of this work earned me artist in residence through the National Parks Arts Foundation, National Park Service, Gettysburg Poetry 2020. The Nameless and the Faceless Women of the Civil War is a collection of 28 poems with 28 accompanying historical essays. This is my second book in the Nameless and the Faceless of the Civil War series. The inspiration for this collection comes from my relative Elvira Finch Moore, seen here on the cover. Born in upstate New York in 1826, she would later marry John L. Moore in 1853 in Fairfax County, Virginia, eight years before the Civil War. Family history of Elvira indicated that she was a traitor, but, but to who, the North, the South? We actually do not know. We do have guards and picket passes that were given to Elvira, in 1863 and 1864 and show her coming and going from Vienna, Virginia, her home to Washington, DC, but in what capacity? Elvira and the mystery that surrounds her is the inspiration for this collection. The nameless and the faceless of the Civil War are for those women without a name, without a face, who now have a voice to express their experiences and suffering in the Civil War. As we know, not everyone who suffered during the Civil War made it into the history books. Through the use of rhyme and the narrative of my poetry, I hope to be able to share their stories and events never before seen or heard. This is my relative, Elvira Finchmore. The story of Elvira is steeped in Civil War history. Specifically, I was told Elvira was a Civil War traitor. And this book cover is from an actual lithograph of Elvira. Added to that mystery, in the back of the photo is a hint, hidden inside pocket where several guards and pickets passes were given to Elvira dating from 1863 to 1864. If you take a look, you can see it says Mrs. John L. Moore, the date is 1863, Vienna, Virginia. And here it says visiting. We don't know actually for what. An unknown family member th through the time took great pains to preserve these documents as they're laminated to preserve them. Was it to just simply preserve the family history or was it left as a clue? A clue for a future relative, maybe myself, to find out the truth of Elvira Finchmore. There was also a corresponding box full of her family letters from about 1853 to 1870 70 and visiting cards. Okay, my gander was up. I had to know the truth. Here we see here there here we see the photo of Elvira's brother-in-law, Erastus C. Weaver. On the far left, you see he's in a union uniform. He was married to Elvira's sister Margaret. The center photo is Elvira's son, Millard J. Moore, who we will talk about a little bit more, uh, a little bit later, and a later photo of Elvira. These are, all, uh, these are all undated. And so the search for the true story of Elvira begins. She was born in Osego County, New York, near Cooperstown in the year 1826. Her father was Judge Lewis Finch, and she was the great granddaughter of Captain Peter Lowe, who served with General Washington and was present with him as they crossed the Delaware. She came to Fairfax in 1852 and in 1853 married a John Lindsay Moore. John Lindsay Moore was the oldest of 13 children born from William Haley Moore and Mary Ann Blackburn, Blackburn of Fairfax County in 1828. The Moores and the Blackburns were some of the oldest Virginia families in Fairfax County. There was an article written and published in the Sunday Star, written by a John Harry Shannon, AKA the Rambler, on October 26, 1919. It is about the Moore family home in Fairfax, their ex extensive, extensive and large family. The name of the home is Springfield House. So from the Sunday Star, the 
Public Library, Washington, D.C., October 26, 1919. I'm going to give you a little excerpt of this. It says, he writes, the little square plane that stands in the parlor, or perhaps it stands in the wide hall that runs through the middle of the house, was the shiniest, merriest little instrument when the package sloop put it ashore at Bell Haven Warehouse. It was the toast of the whole neighborhood then. The neighbors came from distant parts of the county to inspect the new house and admire the new piano. Most of the men came on horseback but many of the ladies came in big, grinding, rumbling family coaches, which were often appropriately called chariots. Some of the poorer neighbors came on foot to see the great new house and marvel at the beauty and the melody of the new piano. And in conclusion, he writes of this very um, lauded family uh, in Virginia. He says, the little square piano, which stands in the parlor, once the toasts of the neighborhood, the merry voice of youth is stilled. Some facts about the Moors, a large Virginia family. In searching to find out the truth behind the mystery of Elvira, we look to her husband, John, to see if any clues emerge from his correspondence. And we know that in a family letter dated February 10th, 1861 from Fairfax County, Virginia, you can see up here uh, at the top of the letter, Fairfax County, February 10th, 1861. He says, dear brother and sister, he writes, probably you think it is strange that the abolition of slavery in Washington would be fatal to us. It would be in this way that our servants would run away and go there and be secreted there by the free Negroes and the abolitionists of that place. A suggestion here that perhaps John and Elvira were slaveholders. No evidence has been found that John was a soldier in either the Union or the Confederacy. Did he pay for a substitute? Was he exempt due to the possibility of owning more than 20 slaves? And did he inherit them from his father, mindful that John would have inherited as the oldest of 13 children, oldest son. However, a contradiction of John begins to emerge as per the ordinance of secession from Vienna, Fairfax County, Virginia on May 23rd, 1861. It's a very important document. John L. Moore, you will see here on the right side, it's highlighted, voted against secession, whereas his brother William, um, on the lower uh, left-hand side, and youngest brother, Jeremiah, who's not on this page, voted for it. Jeremiah joined the Confederacy and was killed during the war. Vienna was one of three jurisdictions in Fairfax County that voted against secession, as there were many Quakers and Northerners in the area. It reads, the ordinance of secession poll taken at Lye Decker's Fairfax County, Virginia, on Thursday, the 23rd of May, 1861, upon the ratification or rejection of an ordinance to repeal the ratification of the Constitution of the United States of America by the state of Virginia and to resume all the rights granted under said Constitution adopted in the convention at the city of Richmond on the 17th day of April, 1861. I wanted to share with you a little bit of history of this document and the importance. And you will note at the very top, if you, if you can make it out, it was a little hard. She says here is a poll taken at Lydecker's, Fairfax County, Virginia. Lydecker's, Virginia, Vienna store, excuse me, was quickly becoming a community hub. In January of 1860, area residents petitioned the Virginia General Assembly to have an election precinct located at the house of A. Lidecker. His name was Abram. On May 23rd, 1861, Fairfax voters gathered at polling locations throughout the county, including Lidecker stores, you see at the top, for a referendum on an ordinance passed the previous month by a special convention. The ordinance to repeal the ratification of the Constitution of the United States of America by the state of Virginia and to resume all the rights and powers granted under said constitution, better known as 
the Virginia Ordinance of Secession was adopted by the voters of Fairfax County and Virginia as a whole, but three Fairfax districts voted against secession, including Lidecker's, Acontink, and Lewinsville. At Lidecker's store, Abram Lidecker was joined by 76 other individuals who voted against ratification of the ordinance. The total vote in the district was 44 for ratification and 77 against. Built only two years prior to the event, Lidecker store was already the center of the community, serving as a polling location for one of the most important votes in Virginia history. And there we have John Moore. So what changed John's mind when he wrote that letter to his brother and sister in 1861 about his servants to May of 1861? I am still searching and I am still researching these unanswered questions. In a box full of the Moore Finch family letters, I discovered a letter written by Elvira to her sister in New York about her wedding day. Again, this is Osego County, New York. You will also note the letter is addressed, you can see here, to Mrs. Erastus C. Weaver, Elvira's sister's Margaret. You will remember in that earlier slide, Erastus C. Weaver was in a Union uniform. He would later fight for the Union in the 121st New York Infantry. Here, we see the instance of so many families of the Civil War brother against brother, family against family, and how terrible that, that must have been. The letter you can see here was written from Peach Grove, Fairfax, um, October 23rd, 1853, and it also contained a piece of Elvira's wedding veil. I mean, look at even the stamp, how cool that was. It was strange yet curious for me to read these letters, some of which looked like they hadn't been disturbed in over 160 plus years. It was also quite humbling, mindful. The engagement ring I have worn uh, for the last 32 years was from Elvira's granddaughter, Adarla. In my quest in zeal to find out the history of this family, Trader began to diminish as I read the words of Elvira to her sister, Margaret. Reading her thoughts from so many years ago, the innermost feelings of sharing the joy of her wedding day with her sister. Mindful for me as a poet, it is never just words on a page. It was amazing for me when I opened that letter to find this piece of her wedding veil. You can see there's some kind of decoration on it and it is pristine white, uh, which is unbelievable. It's, it's not yellow in, in, any, in any way. Our historians find and painstakingly document the stories of our past, but they don't always explore the deeper meaning of the words that are defining the story. As a poet, this is what I do. And that is how I was able to write Nameless and Faceless Women, which we will discuss in a moment. And to add even more Civil War history to the story, in another family painting seen here, which was also part of Elvira's story, also had a pocket in the back of this painting. What you are seeing here is the remains of the farm or home at Bailey's Crossroads at Fairfax County, Virginia. This painting was done in 1941 by William Parker Hudson, who was married to Elvira's granddaughter, Emmy. This painting has historical significance as it was located on the property where President Abraham Lincoln and several invited guests, including the abolitionists, Samuel and the poet Julia Ward Howe stood to review the Union troops in November of 1861 at Bailey's Crossroads. The event so inspired Ms. Howe, she would go on to write a poem which became the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which became the Anthem of the North. In 1897, the property was purchased by Elvira's son, Miller J. Moore, for use as a summer residence. 
It has humbled me to realize that on the property once owned by my relative, the poet Julia Ward Howe was inspired to write that poem. Unfortunately, you could see it fell into great disrepair and burned down in 1942. And at that time, the property was owned by two of Millard's daughters, Adarla and Mildred. So Adarla, Mildred, and Emmy were all sisters. They were Millard's son, uh, daughters and they were Elvira's granddaughters. Just have a little connection there. In an article in the Washington Evening Star dated December 9th, 1942, it reads, it was over these fields that General McClellan received revived Army of the Potomac, smarting from the defeat it met at the hands of the Confederates during the summer, staged the grand review for President Lincoln on November 20th, 1861. 20,000 Washingtonians spent half a day traversing the seven miles to the crossroads to witness it. Nearly 100,000 infantry, cavalry, and artillery troops took part in the parade. Away from the review that day came a woman who suddenly had seemed to hear a call from the thousands of distressed mothers of the boys who had paraded in one of the last demonstrations by the Army of the Potomac before it went out to resume bloody fighting. Back at the old Willard Hotel, Ms. Howe wrote her stirring poem. And of course, we know again that um, this was owned later by um, Miller J. Moore. And um, unfortunately, it, it, um, it was very dilapidated and fell into ruin and um, burned down. This all seems so very complicated. Or maybe it's just as simple as trying to understand this family member and her role in the Civil War. I'm not sure there'll be a definitive conclusion to all this ambiguity. I thought trying to solve the mystery of Elvira is what was really important when I started this journey. But as I may never truly find out her role in the Civil War, I can at least try to bring forth the, the women of the Civil War and bring the lost voices to life. No matter her role, I'm humbled to dedicate this book to her because at every twist and turn, it cries out, what would I have done if it were me? If you look closely at this photo, her expression reveals nothing. Her smile, there is none, but her lips are set firm with no smile and her eyes stare straight at you. And so we're still left in wonder. They actually have a little haunting, sad effect, her eyes, if you look straight on and how very beautiful this representation is. Let's begin. The Nameless and the Faceless Women of the Civil War is a collection of 28 poems and 28 essays inspired by my relative Elvira and her story. In thinking of the families marking her as a traitor, I wonder why she was branded in that manner. And that made me to think of all the women of the Civil War, perhaps finding themselves in the most difficult of situations that they never would have thought possible and what they did to survive. I wondered then of so many women who experienced and suffered during the war, the slaves, nurses, civilians, those who perhaps starved to death, fell to disease or simply died of a broken heart. What of them? In order to try to identify with these women, I found their words haunting and riveting as I researched actual Civil War diaries, especially from the women of the South. Much of the fighting in the Civil War that took place during the Civil, that took place was in the South. And it was through their words and sacrifice that brought me to their voices. As difficult as some of their stories were to read, their pain and suffering and loss was captivating with each page. But I stayed true to their words empathizing with them the great expense it took to write these diaries and honoring those who did. Honoring them here by telling some of their stories, some still unknown but not forgotten. And although these, these diaries and events contain heartbreaking and poignant events, there are glimmers of hope and survival that come through. We must remember the roles of women pre-Civil War were quite limited. 
you know, wife, mother, caregiver, the exodus of the men of the household during the war for so many women forced them to pick up the hoe, cipher the cost and volume of harvested goods and learn new ways to support their families. And they did. Women became nurses never done before, teachers, painters, seamstresses, overseers of their own land. It was the beginning of women in the forefront who would rally to have their voices heard and fight for their own equality for future generations. For the most part, the narrator in the poem is a woman, a nurse, or the voice of a soldier speaking of a woman lost to history. We will hear a heartbreaking story from Charlotte Wickham Lee, the daughter-in-law of Robert E. Lee. We will hear from General Stone, Stonewall Jackson about the little child, Janie Corbin, the voice of a heartbroken mother whose son was killed at the Klingle Farm after the Battle of Gettysburg, July 1st through 3rd, 1863. The poem Winchester, Virginia, 1862, was inspired by the diary of Cornelia Peake McDonald, a Civil War diarist, whose description of the death of her baby daughter Bess in Winchester, Virginia, in 1862, was so heartbreaking it inspired the poem. There are several poems that we do know who's speaking. This was done to the deep emotional and heartbreaking moment of their experience of the war and its aftermath. This was also done in the nameless and faceless of the Civil War. One of the poems we do know who is speaking is called My Absalom. In this poem, we hear from John Wilkes Booth's sister, Asia Booth Clark. We know from history that John Wilkes Booth was extremely close to his older sister, Asia Booth Clark, and his mother. Asia would give us a glimpse into the pain that she and her family were submitted to after the assassination in a book she wrote and was published in 1866. The book is called Booth Memorials, written about her, her famous acting father, Junius Brutus Booth. She cries out in the book, calamity without precedent has fallen on our country. We have all families secure in domestic love and retirement are stricken desolate. The name we would have enwreathed in laurels is dishonored by his son, his well-beloved, his bright boy, Absalom. While this paragraph comes from this book, it's located in the second paragraph in the introduction, placed there on purpose, in my opinion, not to be missed, stating unequivocally the author's pain. Another poem that we do know who is speaking is called Evergreen Cemetery, 1863. In this poem, we hear directly from the cemetery's caregiver at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg, July 1st through 3rd, 1863, and that is Elizabeth Thorne and her descriptions of the aftermath of the battle. Elizabeth was six months pregnant at the time of the battle and managed to bury 105 Union soldiers on her own in the blazing July heat. This singular act would herald her as the angel of Gettysburg. This is a little bit of an unusual approach to the Civil War. For the first time, both literature and history are entwined to bring forth voices never heard before, voices lost in the stillness of time. The rhyme and the narrative of the poetry of the expression given to those who never made it into the history books, yet suffered equally as those who did. Of course, I could not give a name in the face to those who are speaking. I, I still can't do that, right? But listen to their declarations as they share their stories of the Civil War. Again, as in Nameless and Faceless of the Civil War, here, the lines of North and South are blurred. The reason being quite simply that suffering has no boundaries. I will now read several selected poems from the 28 poems and essays in the Nameless and Faceless Woman of the Civil War. Let us begin to listen to the humanity of history as those lost and forgotten of the past come to life. The first poem is called Rooney's Wife. I am not so famous as my husband you see. History has faded me from sight, but that will not stop me to tell you my story of heartbreak, loss, and flight. I came to the family of Ari Lee was the name and fell in love with the second son. 
Tis William Henry Fitzhugh Lee, my life, my joy, my everything. God's will, you see, was done. My name I shall tell you is Charlotte Wickham Lee. Of my short life, I will now tell. Newlyweds in the Civil War of such things that did dispel. From the first of our marriage, I worried my heart of marches and battles and so, and deaths by scores with no end, my life, my husband, please know. On a hot July day in 1862, I buried our child, you see. Our beautiful boy was taken from earth. Oh God, oh God, help me please. And yet I continued on expecting another babe. My heart became broken beyond compare. As soon she was to follow beside her brother, a sweet girl, beautiful and fair. Of these losses that cut my heart and took the light from my eyes, there was yet another agony from which I could not arise. They told, you, they told me you were captured by the North and so was offered your brother in your stead for you to come and be by my side, but it was refused and my heart again bled. There are such times in life, of this I tell you now, there is such a thing as death from a broken heart. It took me of this, I avow. Here we see the gravesite of Charlotte Wickham Lee. There was no actual photo that uh, I could find of Charlotte Wickham Lee, only her gravesite. And um, in the book, there is also a picture of her gravesite and their children, which are right in front of her. Her story was so moving and so heartbreaking, it, it just needed to be heard. While we know she's not nameless, she remains faceless in life and in death. I came upon the tragic story of Charlotte while reading Mary P. Cooling's book, The Lee Girls. The book follows the lives of Confederate General Robert E. Lee and his wife, Mary Custis Lee, with a concentration around their four daughters. In this book, we hear about the obscure yet, tr yet tragic life of Charlotte, the wife of General Lee's second son, General William Fitzhugh Lee. General Lee's only consolation about what happened to his dear uh, daughter-in-law and all of her suffering, suffering, he says, quote, joined her little cherubs and our angel Annie. This was Lee's daughter, Annie, who passed away on October 20th, 1862 in heaven. It seems to me that the suffering and heartache that, it's, it seems to me that the silent suffering and heartache so many women of the Civil War experienced was embodied in the short and sad life of Charlotte Wickham Lee. Charlotte's memory lives on here as a reminder to all that not all casualties of the Civil War were upon the battlefield. The next poem is called Janie Corbin. There is a child I will tell you of the tale that is true. Her name was Janie, met her Christmas of 62. It was when I made my camp in the winter of that year, Moss Neck Plantation, the Rappahannock was near. And such was the time I spent at her parents' home, the child Janie and I befriended, forever known. Lively and daring that warmed my being. My daughter was just born, yet I was not seeing. And here comes Janie and calls my name. She laughs and giggles all the same. For this lovely child that God has brought forth has eased my longing heart for all that it's worth. And now the time has come to bid adieu, for the calling of war rings anew. I bade farewell to the child I could not ignore. Oh, this little girl, so how I adore. And so I heard the most distressing of news. Janie had scarlet fever. Oh, I was so blue. But her parents said she would recover just fine and be well to see the spring so sublime. I breathed a sigh of relief, you know, and one day later, later, please God it is to forgo that my little Janie with the heart of gold succumbed to the fever I cannot hold her until such time as God calls me home. Wait for me, Janie, we will share the throne. There are some stories and events of the Civil War that seem to go beyond the realm of heartbreak. The story of Janie Corbin and Confederate General Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson is just really one of them. 
While in, in camp in the winter of 1862, 1863, General Jackson resided at Moss Neck Plantation outside Fredericksburg, Virginia. The owners of the residence had several children. The youngest was Janie at five years old. A friendship and love grew between Janie and General Jackson. He adored Janie, perhaps thinking of his own daughter, Julia, who was born on November 22nd, 1862, and whom he would not see until April April of 1863 when she was five months old. Stonewall Jackson would be wounded at the Battle of Chancellorsville on May 2nd, 1863. He would succumb to, his, to death from pneumonia on May 10th. His wife Anna and baby daughter Julia were by his side at the time of his death. His last words were, let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the tree. One cannot help but wonder if in fact, the child Janie was there in heaven, resting under the shade of that tree, waiting for General Jackson. The Klingle House. My eyes could barely see for the tears that stung my sight. News my son Ethan had ascended to your almighty's light. The letter I held in my hand from your commander I see to tell me of your bravery so that others could be free. In early July of 1863, upon the battlefield of our North, Gettysburg tis the name, so how you did go forth. Three days of such fighting, the slaughter I cannot grasp, so many gone like you, my son, I fear I shall collapse. But as I read the letter and heard of how you died, it is if I can see you, my son, and be there at your side. So now I will take my breath and read the part of your pain and left this earth a better man, of this I shall refrain. Twas on July the 4th, the holiday of our nation's birth, they found your body, my son, with your comrade next to you, God's will you see was done. It says here you were wounded and tried to take shelter, I see, to the Klingle farm under the porch, yet it was not meant to be. The owner came and found his farm littered with the dead of three days of the din of battle where the nation bled. I see you, my son, under that porch as you tried to save your life, yet God had other plans for you and took you from that strife. There is no more to say just now, the letter it ends with thanks for the sacrifice of so many, my Ethan in the ranks. I actually uh, visited uh, the Klingle House here. You see pictured at the Gettysburg National Military Park. Um, I stood on that very front porch. Um, it is beautiful, it is haunting, and uh, to me, the, the sadness is, is actually palpable. Um, it's, it's on the Emmons, Emmonsburg Road and um, on the far end, and it's, it's very kind of quiet there. Um, that was the inspiration uh, for this poem. The Klingle House was purchased by Daniel Klingle in April of 1863, and he lived there with his wife, Hannah, and their two young children, Samuel and Catherine. Little did Daniel and his family realize that in just three months, the house would be surrounded, scented in the midst of the bloodiest days of fighting, at the Battle of Gettysburg on July 2nd and 3rd, 1863. The morning of July 2nd, the family was warned by the Union forces that they must leave their home. They vacated their property as per the warnings and headed by way of the Trossel Farm to the base of Little Round Top. On July 4th, the Klingle family returned to their home to find a devastating scene. Bullet holes riddled the house and powder marks charred the walls from inside the house where the soldiers had taken refuge to continue their fight. Crops were destroyed, as well as most of the fences around the property. He says, the farm was covered by the dead. Bodies lay all around the house. Two were just inside the gate and two others under the porch where they must have crawled for shelter before dying of their wounds. One shattered tree in the Klingles orchard concealed four dead soldiers huddled around a cooking pan with food still in it. Again, I have stood at the Klingle House and stood upon that very small porch. From there, the voice of this unknown woman comes to light to tell us of her son. 
We understand his great sacrifice and the pride she had in his death. And again, to me, there's a palpable sadness that surrounds this house, silent and quietly heartbreaking. It is brought to life by this unknown mother and son bound together forever on the fields of Gettysburg. Winchester, Virginia, 1862. I made my way past the front of my door to where the earth was disturbed just days before and stood at, and gazed at the small square of earth that housed my baby two years after her birth. And as I knelt before the tiny grave, the tears falling that could not save her from the early death, baby girl, come, come back and take my breath. And as I stared at the flowers that bloom and surround you now in an earthly tomb, I heard a thunderous noise and raised my head to see the swarm of soldiers our Johnny Reb. In wonder of wonders, it was ever so true. Our daring leader stonewalled and I knew that soon our Winchester, it was known, would battle the Yankees for our home. It was then I saw the general come near and saw my face flushed with tear and stood with me beside my baby's grave, his eyes grieving he could not save and reached for my hand with effortless grace saying he knew of the pain of which I faced for so he too did lose a son, born stillborn, he said, God's will was done. I met his eyes so deeply colored blue and knew of his pain, it was so true. Watched in silence as he reached to embrace the little violets around my baby's place and told me gently as he turned to leave, God is with her, do not grieve. Cornelia Peak McDonald was a woman who lived in the town of Winchester, Virginia at the time of the, of the Civil War, 1862. She went on to keep a diary of her experiences during the war entitled A Diary with the Reminiscence of War and Refugee Life in the Shenandoah Valley, 1860 to 1865. Her town of Winchester would change occupation from Confederate to Union 72 times. Her husband, Angus, joined the Confederacy, leaving Cornelia and their nine children to try to survive in the most difficult of times. Cornelia describes the fear and horror as the Union Army came and occupied her home, moving her and her children to just one room. She writes of the daily struggle for food and the daily struggle just to keep her children safe and well. The inspiration for this poem Winchester, Virginia, 1862, comes from Cornelia herself, who wrote of her own suffering over the loss of her child, her baby daughter, Bess. Her profound grief at her baby's death was so intense and so heartbreaking, it reached beyond the years as she wrote, quote, one evening as the sun was going down, I held her in my arms. And as she breathed out her little life, her eyes were fixed in my face with the shadow of death over them. The children stood around sobbing, the little breast heaved and panted, one long sigh, and all was still, her eyes still fixed on my face. Ah, that fearful shadow, how I saw it flit over that lovely countenance, withering all its bloom and leaving its own ashen gray to remain forever. Cornelia wrote in her diary that she actually did see Confederate General Stonewall Jackson one Sunday in town at, at, uh, in church. He was deep in prayer. General Jackson did have a presence, as we know, in Winchester in 1862. And I couldn't help but think that perhaps the general did stop to comfort an unknown grieving woman sometime over the course of the Civil War. A woman without a name, without a face, but with now a voice to share a moment of grief over the loss of a child, a woman perhaps just like Cornelia. My Absalom, I remember at the time of your birth, mother's favorite of all her boys, there came to her a premonition that cut her soul from joy. For in the firelight of when she nestled you tight, 
She saw the flames rise and fall and told me of your plight. I knew then as the flames danced and licked the crackling wood within that somehow, some way, my brother, there would be no absolution from sin. And as I watched you grow and change into the handsomest man of all, yet in your heart raged some hate of this it would befall. Such fame you had notwithstanding, a mother's love as I knew, to save you from impending doom, for this I bid adieu. Yet do we know the story of Absalom, King David's third most boy, like you, my darling Johnny, created in such to destroy. So what of a mother's love, who cried for you on her knee, a life so misunderstood, my darling, my Absalom, you are now free. This is a photo of Asia Booth Clark. Um, she was the older sister and uh, closest to John Wilkes Booth in their growing up years. Um, when John was about six months old, his mother Mary Ann Holmes Booth had a strong premonition that he would die an early and unnatural death. This faithful image stayed with her and with his sister Asia for, for all of their lives. Unfortunately, as we know that, that actually did uh, come true. As the Booth family writer and chronicler, Ada, Asia would write two more books um, along with the book she wrote, an unlocked book uh, about her brother, John, which was, um, this was about the pain her family endured after John assassinated President Lincoln. Again, I mentioned earlier, it's called Booth Memorials. And here she cries out, calamity without precedent has fallen on our country. We of all families secure in domestic love and retirement are stricken desolate. The name he would have been wreathed in laurels is dishonored by his son, his well-beloved, his bright boy, Absalom. So who is Absalom? She's referencing the biblical story of Absalom from King David's third son. John Wilkes was the third Booth son. The Bible says Absalom was praised as the most handsome man in all Israel. He was flawless from head to foot. John was also praised as being the handsomest man in America. Absalom revolted against his own father and tried to steal his kingdom, whereupon he was not successful and destroyed himself. Similarly, John Wilkes, John Wilkes Booth was shot to death on April 26th, 1865 in Port Royal, Virginia after being hunted down by the Union Army for the assassination of President Lincoln. In my Absalom, we hear from Asia reflecting on John who loved his mother, was incredibly famous, yet the fire that raged within him ultimately drove him to destruction. She mentions the vision Mary Ann saw in the firelight when John was just a baby. It spelled out country. And again, that John would die an early and unnatural death. How grievous for Mary Ann Holmes when her vision came true and how, how came true. And Asia's comparison between King David's favorite son, Absalom, and the Booth favorite son, John, is very apt indeed. And the last poem we will read in the new collection, Evergreen Cemetery, Gettysburg, 1863. It was in July of 1863, an event happened here in Gettysburg, you see, a three-day battle of North and South that raged and raged, there was no doubt. And the conclusion, although the North reigned supreme, was death and destruction beyond all dream. My husband, although he did fight for the Union cause it was right, and left me here a caretaker, you see, of Evergreen Cemetery it was known to be, that after the guns had ceased their fire, both sides were left ever so dire. I took up my spade and began to bury the graves of 105 Union, oh, so many. My body was heavy with a new life inside. I buried as many as I could, there was no pride. But what I saw in July of 63 will forever re remain within me. I think of those I never knew, gone now from this earth, forever from view. Yet I know in my heart beyond all of this, almighty God will come and kiss the faces of those men lost to us on earth, immortal in God, forever gone forth. When the Battle of Gettysburg began on July 1st, 1863, one local resident named Elizabeth Thorne was working as the caretaker of Evergreen Cemetery, which occupies a hill just south of Gettysburg. This was originally her husband Peter's job, 
but he was away serving the Union Army with the 138th Pennsylvania and was positioned in Washington, D.C. in Harpers Ferry. She was six months pregnant at the time. She said that following the battle outside in the stifling heat, scores of dead soldiers lay strewn about the hillside and around Gettysburg. This in conjunction with the horrible screams of the wounded and the dying on the battlefield were the sights and sounds that Elizabeth Thorne witnessed. Her home had been used as a battlefield hospital, surgery, amputations occurring on her own bed, ruining what few possessions her family had. She says, everything in the house was gone except three feather beds and a couple of pillows. The beds and a dozen pillows we had brought from the old country, Germany, were not fit to use again. The legs of six soldiers had been amputated on the beds in our house and they were ruined with blood and we had to make way with them. Elizabeth Thorne has been called the angel of Gettysburg for her heroic efforts in those harrowing days and weeks after the battle. Her statue was formerly known as the Gettysburg Women's Civil War Memorial. You can see here, it stands, it stands beside the cemetery gatehouse where she and her husband, Peter, lived for 19 years. And in a way, it represents all the work of all women who are involved in the Civil War. I believe she rests in heaven with the souls of those Union soldiers whom she so selflessly gave a proper burial over 150 years ago upon the battlefield and in a hallowed place, a place called Gettysburg. Before I close, I'd like to share this one last thought with you. Once I had completed the collection, I couldn't help but ask, you know, my husband. I said to him, what do you think? Would Elvira have ever imagined herself on a cover of a book some 118 years after her death? He paused a moment and his reply, she was waiting for you. So with that said, welcome Elvira Finchmore. Welcome the nameless and the faceless women of the Civil War. Thank you.